Loki Season 1 Episode 6 Thoughts So, as usual, spoilers for the MCU leading up to this point, including this episode, I may discuss theories that might spoil upcoming episodes in this video. As usual, I recommend videos talking about Easter eggs and such on the show, especially videos made by Rockstar Screen Rant, Nerdist, Cigar Screen Crush, Black Nerd Comedy, and IGN. Casey of... Dan Casey of Nerdist News. Nerdist used the name Kane a lot for some verbal comedy. For example, instead of saying convenient, he said convenient. I like that. So, I don't usually do reviews for individual seasons. And I consider breaking tradition here, but I don't think I'm... No. I'm, I'm not going to. I'm going to review... I'm going to do a spoiler-free review of the entire show once every episode of every season has aired. And so far, we're looking at at least one more season, so at least... And as far as I understand, the second season is also going to be six episodes. So I'm really psyched about it, but yeah, don't expect... There, there won't be a spoiler-free review by me of season one. Now, let's... So, if this is the first of these videos by me that you watch, then just to get you up to speed, I love every MCU movie, although I don't make any excuses for Iron Man 2, and I love every episode that's come out so far of the Disney Plus MCU shows. So, I, last week, I had a list of all the questions that would either be answered in this final episode of the first season, or simply not be answered in the first season. So, yeah, who is behind the TVA king of... Yeah, I guess let's go with He Who Remains. Actually, yeah, before I continue on the list, I, I don't think I, I... I don't think I remember to note this somewhere else in this document, so I'll do it now before I forget. The... I think the reason that the Timekeepers... The, the fiction of the Timekeepers was made up by He Who Remains is so that... It, I think He Who Remains was made me worried that at some point the TVA would capture another Kang variant and they would be like, this guy looks exactly like that guy in the statue. And then, you know, evidently the, the you know, once Loki is in this rewritten TVA with everyone's mind having been wiped and reset, we're dealing with someone who's not worried about, you know, other variants, and I think that might actually be a sort of show of power. He's basically saying, I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care how, you know, if you see another me, you, you're going to prune them. You're going to erase them from the timeline, and that's that. And I, I don't want to hear any arguments or questions or anything. You know, where he who remains, he had been fairly careful for a while, you know, here here at the end he was a little more yeah. You know, it, it was it was great. Like he really had the energy of someone who's been doing this for way too long. And he, he would like a break. Please, thank you soon, you know. He must have been babysitting. I don't know. Back to the, the questions. Does Rensler really not know? It would appear not. What exactly is Miss Minutes and what are her limits? One of her limits appears to be that she can only be in one place at the same... She, she can't be in more than one place at the same time. Other than that, it's not entirely clear what her limits are, if any, but certainly she knows. She knows about He Who Remains. She knows the truth about the multiversal war. Does whoever is behind the TVA actually believe that they're doing good, or are they just seeking out a selfish goal, such as, for example, getting rid of all the Lokis, and if so is it a Loki behind the TVA? He who remains appears to be correct that the TVA prevents another multiversal war. And he really was, like, he wanted to prevent more war. He just was also okay with, you know, he knows he's going to win. A Kang, the Ryan, is going to win the multiversal war, no matter what. I was a little, I, I wasn't entirely sure if there was going to be, like, a, you know, in the, in the comics... Loki is not Kang, so I was wondering if they were going to change that, because He Who Remains is also not a Kang in the comics, but there doesn't seem to be any. It just, it seems like Lokis are uniquely equipped to flip over the table of the TVA, and that's what 
he who remains was worried about. That's why he's so aggressive in stopping Loki variants. And and you know, to be fair, they did violate the time. They did, they did go outside of what they were supposed to do. He's not going after all Lokis. Does the multiverse really not exist? Will it by the end of season one? It didn't, but it appears it does now. So I guess when the Ancient One and Doctor Strange said, who are you in this vast multiverse? I guess they just hadn't really... You know, that happens every so often in the MCU. They'll say something or do something and then later be like, oh wow, we really should have thought that. Um, never mind, you know, and so we are actually getting the real, the, the Mandarin, you know, and they adjust it so it's not extremely racist anymore. So, you know, I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, it's not like, we, we already know that the Ancient One did say some lies in the Doctor Strange solo movie. Is Kang the season one of the show? Yes. Who is that hiding inside the castle, inside Alive? He who remains. What Nexus event is it that Sylvie creates by her very existence? Based on what some of the Easter egg people on YouTube said, apparently he who remains targeted Sylvie because he could tell that this would lead to her reaching him inside a life, and he wanted her to either replace him or kill him, since killing him would unleash the other Kangs. That's why there was a unique Nexus event when Loki and Sylvie were close together, because the two of them together have a much greater chance of getting to he who remains. And in general, a lot of Lokis cause chaos, and try to become rulers, and thus get to he who remains. It also means that when Ravana said that she didn't even remember the Nexus event that Sylvie was arrested for, it might actually be that she doesn't know the details. Is the TVA really inside the Quantum Realm? We still don't know. What, if anything, will happen if the TVA is, is disbanded? We also don't know. So, this episode is called For All Time Always, the motto of the TVA. And I like how, you know, they, they yet again mess around with, you know, the opening Marvel logo has a bunch of lines from the MCU, from a bunch of various characters. At first I was thinking, oh, they're all going to connect to Loki, but immediately they, there were a bunch that didn't. And, you know, Greta Thunberg makes a, a, you know, yeah, they, they used her line saying, how dare they? Which kind of makes me wonder how she feels about the MCU. Does anyone know? Because I, I don't know, I, I kind of feel like she might enjoy at least aspects of it. Anyway. And other real life people and, you know, I'm not great at deciphering visual stuff, but other, you know, Easter egg people on YouTube, here on YouTube, said that, oh, it's like, you know, several different universes in the multiverse. Okay, you know what? That makes sense. When when they say it, it makes sense. So I'm just going to go with that. I appreciate that they don't show something else before we see Sylvia and Loki reach the castle. We've waited for an entire week already. And Sylvie's nervous. She needs a moment to get her head straight. And some really Assassin's Creed looking statues, but but like clock, yeah, clock faces for faces. And they made, Miss Minutes reappears and they made her really creepy. And it's, it's really just like they changed some of the proportions of her face and the jump scare, of course, but she still opens with, hi y'all. And, and just, yeah, it's, it's, it's so good. I, I will never... Marvel proved me wrong. I bet, no matter how much Miss Minutes you put in Loki or anything else, I will never say too much Miss Minutes. I will let most say that's the right amount of Miss Minutes. I will never say too much Miss Minutes. And, you know, she says, Welcome to the Citadel at the end of time. And I was like, He who remains. And then she says, He who remains. And Miss Minutes offers Loki winning the Battle of New York, killing Thanos, getting the Infinity Gauntlet, getting the throne of Asgard. And you can really see he's like, oh, wow, that's, you know, and, and some of these great people pointed out, you know, in, in like trailers and TV spots and such, we've seen footage, new footage of Loki in the, in the, 
uh, Stark Tower near the end of the first Avengers movie. And in, I think, didn't one of them theorize that maybe this time Loki was able to mind control Tony? And in that case, I mean, yeesh. If you, when you look at how, how effective Tony is against the, the, ah, Chitauri army, if he was fighting the other Avengers, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a, yeah, you know, Loki, the entire Chitauri army, those massive, like, snake things, Tony, against the Avengers, against the might of Earth, yeah, I think that means he wins. And one where he's, like, on the throne of Asgard, and he's, like, loving it. And Renslayer is still waiting for Miss Minutes to download the files. And it seems like Miss Minutes can apparently only be in one place at the same time. That's when he realized that. This isn't what I asked for. I know. But he thinks this will be more useful for you. And by the end of the episode, we still don't know what that is. But whatever it was, it, like, you know, the, the she, she really changes her tune between receiving that and then when she talks to Mobius. So she read that, and it really... It gave her a goal. And, and this is where it's really great that we already know that I'm... I didn't write down his name. The guy who plays... He Who Remains Here, we already know he plays Kang the Conqueror in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Which still sounds like a wrestler event. The... the yeah, so we know, you know, in the MCU, He Who Remains is a Kang variant that won the multiversal war. And it makes sense, you know, he says, I made, you know, I managed to get Elioth working for me. And we've already seen, I mean, he, he is like, it's, it's like if Kirby were really angry, yeah. You know, like, eating everything and eating it so very fast. Like, classic Loki conjures up an entire, like, ah, what's it called? Asgard illusion, and it just goes to town on that sucker. Like, it is, yeah, I 100% I believe that he managed to win the multiversal war with Eliath and, yeah. And he says, let's go talk in my office. And Loki and Sylvie stand behind him, swords drawn in the elevator. And, you know, he's got one of the uh, time twisters, I, I think they call them. Which is a good, like, it's a, like, the very first and the very last episode has, you know, the very first episode, Loki learns how a time twister works. Starts using it against the, you know, to, yeah, start using it for his purposes. And then, you know, the, and, and yet at the end, he doesn't get exactly what he wants by the end of the episode. I forgot to set my phone on silent. I will do that extremely quickly. There we go. And, and in this episode, the final episode of the first season, Sylvie, at first, you know, the, a time twister is used against her. Then she gets her hands on it. She uses it, but by the end of the episode, you know, I mean, we don't really, we don't see what happens to her after she kills He Who Remains. But it doesn't seem like this is, you know, she didn't, she just wanted the TVA off her back. Who knows what the, you know, if, even if she were okay with everything burning, who knows if, if the Kangs are going to let her have any peace now that they know that she might be a threat. So I, I really appreciate that book ending that the, you know, Sylvie is where Loki was. Yeah. And we see B B-15 hunt the lured a timekeeper guard to where Renz, just Renslayer was kidnapped from so that the guard can see that she's a variant. And, you know, she, the Easter egg people pointed out that she, she's a principal and the name she's using is the name that she took in the comics when she and Kang went to like, what was it, 1903 or something, to ter Terminate or something. It's, I really like how playful he who remains is. He's literally having fun dodging sword strikes from Loki and Sylvie. 
and he's got transcripts of everything said and done. <clears throat> and he tries to set Loki and Sylvie against each other. And we again get the, the determinism versus free will debate. Both, you know, he who remains, Rensselaer and Mobius. And some of the, the backstory for the, the whole Kang thing is the same as in the comics. Let's see. I really appreciate it. He who remains points out how narcissistic it is. Like, you know, oh, I like your hair, I like your nose, and, and this whole thing. It's, yeah, and, and he explains, Elias was created by all the tears in reality, and then he took... Yeah, got control over it, so, yeah. And... See. Yeah, and he offers Loki and Sylvie taking over control as long as they keep the order. And I, I love that bit where he said, we just crossed the threshold. And then he admits, what was it he said? I fibbed before. I only knew everything that was going to happen up to a point, and we just passed it, and just, yeah. And Loki tries to prevent Sylvie from killing he who remains, she feels betrayed by him, and Sylvie attacks Loki, and they have a proper fight. This is nothing like the dance-like fight they had at the start of Episode 3, where they're just testing each other, basically. And Sylvie goes to try to kill he who remains, we get a slow motion shot, Loki gets in front of her, throws away his sword, and I really like the, the bit where he says, you can't trust, and I can't be trusted. And this thing, it's it's just this heartbreaking thing, like, basically, he, he really is telling the truth. He really is, you know, he's, he's spent so much of his life getting good at lying and manipulating, and suddenly he's in a situation where that's not going to get him anywhere, and he does genuinely, like, he, if she believed him, if Sylvie believed what he said, she might actually stop trying to kill he who remains. So he tries telling the truth for, you know, maybe the first time in his life, and it just doesn't work. Like, actually, yeah, if, if like, the, the, um, I've, I've, I'm still one, not 100% certain if, if it was Odin or Loki changing the, the the appearance of the baby that Odin found in, you know, ah, what's it called? Jotunheim, at the end of the, the war between Asgard and Jotunheim. Still not entirely sure which of them made Loki look, yeah, more like an Asgardian. But certainly if that was Loki, I mean, it must have been just by reflex, you know, but... If that really was him, then he's been hiding who he was his entire life, you know, and including to some, you know, to, to an extent from himself, basically. Not saying that, okay, that sounded like I'm exonerating. Odin still really should have told him about his real parentage much, much sooner. And Loki and Sylvie kiss, and there was much rejoicing in the shipping community. And Sylvie sends Loki through a time portal and goes to kill he who remains. So the kiss was partly a trick on, on her part. And the, uh, you know, Sylvie stabs he who remains, and he's like, see you soon. And we see the timeline branch off in many different directions now that he who remains is dead. And... And Loki's tearing up at the TVA, and the TVA people run right past Loki, not trying to stop him anymore. And he tries to explain to Mobius, Mobius doesn't recognize him, thinks he's an analyst. And Loki looks and sees now there's only one timekeeper statue, and it's Kang. And he's wearing the armor that he does in the comics. So, let's see. Um, yeah, so the... the um, Let's see. So, so yeah, Kang took over the TVA and mind-wiped all the people working there. And Loki, I guess, 
yeah, I don't know. Maybe the mind wipe happened before Loki reached the the TVA, or maybe it just didn't affect him since he hadn't already had his mind wiped, and everybody else work everybody who works at the TVA has had their mind wiped at least once already. So maybe it's that. As a uh, actually, if if Kang's can't mind wipe Loki's. That might help explain why they're trying to get rid of them. They don't like what they can't control. But but yeah, really excited to see Season 2. So, the multiverse exists in the MCU as of the end of this episode. Excellent episode. I feel like there are still a lot of questions left unanswered by the end of the episode. I feel like there are a lot of people saying, you know, this is... This is exactly how you should end a Disney Plus MCU show. This is the best ending to an MCU. This is the end of season one. As we, we already know there's going to be at least one more season. This is not the end. It is much harder to make a definitive final episode than the end of a season. You know, let's, let's not go crazy here. Let's hold off until we see the next season before we say that it has the best ending of, of one of these. But anyway and sort of a post credit scene stamp that says Loki will return in Season 2. And I, we're, we're going to get at least some multiverse in the movies that come out between this episode and Season 2 starting. I think for sure the multiverse will be a factor in Spider-Man No Way Home, which, according to Wikipedia, is currently slated for December 17th of this year. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, March 25th of next year. We don't yet know when Season 2 is coming out. Some people on YouTube have already guessed that the MCU Kang would be able to jump between universes in the multiverse in addition to time travel, since at least according to Endgame, it is not it is simply impossible to uh, what's it called? You know, if if Kang Kang can't conquer you know, in, in the comic, Kang travels between different points in time and conquers. If he did that in the MCU, he would be creating divergent timelines all over the place according to the the yeah, the way that time travel has been laid out so far. It's not impossible he has access to a different time travel and the rules will change somehow, but it looks a lot like it's more that he he conquers different universes in the multiverse. And we haven't like there's nothing there's there's nothing in the rule book that says that a cane can't change, you know, he, yeah, he can, he can conquer different parts of them, he, he can conquer different universes in the multiverse until he's conquered every universe in the multiverse, at, at least hypothetically, that's the thing, you know, according to He Who Remains, the last time that was attempted, it just led to a lot of chaos, and eventually He Who Remains was the only Kang left, and he knew that if he didn't prevent Kang's the other Kangs, you know, then then there would just be chaos again. Let's see. And I also saw at least one person point out this episode has a lot of exposition. Like they they get right inside the door of the castle and they are hit by a wall of exposition. Like th this is this is a very talky episode, and I love it, but I. Uh, we better get some answers, because there's still a lot of... Yeah, anyway. Let's see. The... And... I don't really understand how the death of He Who Remains releases the other canes. But I guess we're just not meant to yet. It's just we, we know that it happened. We don't know exactly what made it happen. Now, let's see. I really like He Who Remains outfit. I think they did a good job of, you know, I mean, yeah, others have pointed out. It's basically, ah, I forget his name and I forgot to put it in my notes. Um, it's not Kang the Conqueror, it's, it's the, yeah, I, I, 
Im Immortus? I feel like that's the name. It might be. But yeah, you know, and, and they, they changed the, you know, they toned down the colors somewhat so that it's, yeah, the classic Kang costume, those exact colors would not work in, in live action. I still really love the, the right. Is do I think this is the best finale of a Disney Plus MCU show, of of the three? Even considering, even just for a season, yeah, for a season because it's not for a show yet. I really don't have very many negative things to say about the Captain America Winter Soldier finale. That one's still my favorite. I I feel like that's the one that delivered what it needed to and what it should. This one, I love this episode, but boy, are there a lot of questions. and We don't even know how many months we're going to have to wait to get answers to them. I'm excited, but I mean, I was already kind of annoyed with how little answer, how, how few answers we're getting to the mysteries of this show on a weekly basis. Now it's going to be months. I, I don't think it would have hurt if they had given us a tiny bit more in the way of answers. Now, I've heard a theory that the reason things are different when Loki meets Modus is that he's now in a new timeline. The timeline changed at the, the lightning strike when, when Kang, okay, and me remains said, we have now passed the threshold. Which was before Loki was thrown through the time door. And he who remains eating the apple is a reference to the Garden of Eden, the forbidden fruit from the Tree of Knowledge. Some say that MCU Kang won't be Reed Richards' descendant, like in the comics, but instead the descendant of Tony Stark. You know, science, ego, all that. That makes a lot of sense. Certainly the MCU never goes for very long without a villain having a personal connection to Tony Stark. I say that with love. So, it seems like the multiverse will likely lead to an adaptation of Secret War, specifically the one where heroes from different parts of the multiverse have to battle the... the yeah. Which, yeah, it, it sounds fun. I, I really, I have to admit, it is very enticing that we don't yet know exactly, like, okay, we know Dark Avengers in some form are coming. We know Young Avengers in some form are coming. Secret Wars would make a lot of sense, but we don't know exactly, like, you know, what exactly is going to be the, the next big, you know, like, before the release of Endgame, we always knew, okay, they're building to another Avengers movie. They, they did that four times, you know. Had a bunch of movies building to a to an Avengers movie that followed up on that. Well, I guess an argument can be made. It was three times, and so there weren't that many movies between the two. The Avengers 3 and 4. But anyway, it's exciting. You know, we have Young Avengers, we have Dark Avengers, and now the door is wide open. For Secret Wars, so yeah, it's it's. I gotta admit, it's it's really I I. I like that I am so uncertain as to what the next really big thing is going to be. We only know about the solo movies. We don't know what the next big thing exactly is going to look like, and that's very yeah. It's, so. And, and yeah, now that the multiverse exists in the MCU, I guess there's a chance that some of the universes seen in the What If miniseries will be canon. Maybe Secret Wars will recruit characters from some of them. I mean, I get that it will be a little awkward if the first time we see, the, you know, yeah, we know What If is going to be animated. So if the What Ifs and if the, those universes show up later, the first time we saw them, it was animated, and then the second time, it's live action that's going to be a little let's we're going to need to adjust to that but i do think that it is a very interesting and i it's been a while since i looked it up but as far as i recall like the what if comics in outside of the mcu in the comics i think the, the what if comics are just kind of one-off things that are kind of fun to do but they're not really canon as part of the multiverse but it almost must be in the MCU, right? I mean, we just got the mul the multiverse is now open as of the end of this episode. And okay, so it's going to be like three weeks before What If starts premiering. But it it would seem kind of silly to not at least for some of them tie into the larger MCU. I, I don't know, but 
it just it, it seems like an interesting idea. And so so far the MCU hasn't really done standalone. And I I love the DCU standalone movies. I think the DCU is much, much better now that it does standalone. Although, again, I haven't watched Wonder Woman 1984 yet. I hear it's garbage. I can imagine might be you can't get them all right, but you know, all the other one-offs I've seen all the other one-offs and they've all been really solid. So, the, the DCU is good at standalone. The MCU is excellent at... Okay, to be fair, sometimes the DCU is excellent at standalone, but the MCU is excellent at shared continuity. I, th I think it would... I, I don't mind if they start doing one-off stuff that just isn't going to be brought up again, but I feel like it would make a lot of sense since some of these are really interesting concepts that we could do with watching more than once. But anyway, He Who Remains might be my top pick for most entertaining performance of a villain role in the MCU. You can really tell the actor is loving playing the role. And I, I heard someone on YouTube, what was it? I think they said that He Who Remains comes across as someone who has had the script for an extremely long amount of time and finally he's seeing it play out in in real life and he is giddy with excitement over it and just per like did i remember that wrong was he literally eating popcorn when they were fight was he like did he literally or was it the app I, I forget but it's just yeah he he I, I watched it several days ago but but yeah the and there's a lot to process in this episode so i don't remember absolutely everything but yeah that is it for, yeah, I, I'm i really, really psyched to see what they're going to do in Season 2. I hope there's going to be more answers than in Season 1. But, yeah, that is it for this one. So, yeah, it'll be, I, th I think it's about three weeks before the next time they put out a, was it 11th of August or something? That's around three weeks. Yeah, so... Yeah, the, the, um, it's, it's going to be difficult to wait, but I'm really look. it, it looks amazing, what if it looks amazing, so, yeah, catch you next time.